Seto Kaiba was obsessed with strength, which is why he filled his deck with rare and powerful cards that he'd used to crush his opponents, and was the first to laugh at lesser duelists for even considering weaker cards. But despite how often Kaiba paraded the power of his particular strategy, he used some terrible cards that even the weakest deck builders would laugh at. So today, we're looking at some of Kaiba's worst cards, how they held him back from becoming the king of games, and why these cards did so terribly in the TCG. Reigning over the number 10 spot is arguably the most legendary and meta-warping card in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Chaos Emperor Dragon and Void of the End, and CED earned that title. In order to summon to the field, you have to banish a light and dark monster from your grave, which is a small price to pay for getting access to its absurd effect. Because if you're willing to pay 1000 light points, you can send every card from both players' hand and field to the graveyard, and then inflict 300 points of damage to your opponent for every card sent. This made it the perfect game ender. And while it only appeared as part of Kaiba's arsenal a single time, its impact cannot be understated, as its presence helped to end a decades-long rivalry between Kaiba and Siegfried von Schrodinger, proving to the world that Kaiba Corp reigns supreme. You see, after Kaiba Corp stocks crash, Kaiba set up the KC Grand Championship to regain the public's trust. And Schroeder saw this as an opportunity to humiliate Kaiba by having the winner of his tournament to be the head of his rival company. Kaiba eventually caught on to Schroeder's plans. However, he knew that by disqualifying him, it would only make Kaiba Corp seem even weaker. So instead, he challenged Schroeder to a duel. If Kaiba won, he would save his reputation and Schroeder would be officially disqualified. But if Schroeder won, not only would he remain in the tournament, but Kaiba Corp would be humiliated. So, in a way, everything Kaiba had ever worked for rode on this duel. And Schroeder initially held a huge advantage with his Valkyrie strategy, especially when he equipped Kaiba's XYZ Dragon Cannon with Nibble Lung's Ring forcing him to discard every monster he drew during the draw phase while keeping him locked under the effects of the three goddesses. And this advantage culminated in the summon of Brynhilde, to which Schrodinger equipped with the enchanted sword of Nuthunk, which made virtually every dragon monster in Kaiba's strategy useless against the Valkyrie. Or at least almost every dragon monster, because with a lucky draw from Graceful Charity, Kaiba managed to draw into Chaos Ember Dragon. And with emergency provisions, he had just enough life points to wipe the field in both players' hands clean burning Schrodinger for a lot of damage, and leveling the playing field just enough for Kaiba to strike back. And strike back he did, as on his following turn, Chaos Emperor Dragon was one of the dragons that Kaiba returned to the field with Dimension Fusion in order to perform an utterly ruthless OTK, saving Kaiba Corp's reputation and finally leaving Schrodinger Corp in the dust, for the time being anyways. So with such a dominant display in the anime, how did Chaos Emperor Dragon turn into one of the worst cards that Kaiba's ever played? Well, for a while, it wasn't. In fact, Chaos Emperor Dragon might just be the most meta-warping card in the game's history. You see, Chaos Emperor Dragon's effect is busted, but was especially strong in classic Yu-Gi-Oh where few other cards matched its power level. And the slower game it meant that it was really easy to flip your graver with light and dark monsters ready for you to drop this bomb of a monster and either level the playing field with its wipe or just end the game outright with its burn. This made CED an absurd card, but what put it over the top was its synergy with both Sandgan and Witch of the Black Forest, which you could summon to the field alongside CED to get a free search after you use its field wipe effect, which you would use in order to search out for Yadagarasu, a spirit monster that can skip your opponent's draw phase if it can deal battle damage, preventing them from drawing for the turn. And because CED's wipe dealt with all obstacles, Yadagarasu had an open field, which left your opponent with zero cards in hand and no way to draw to free them from the lock while Yadagarasu poked for 200 damage each turn, solely but surely securing game. This was known as the Yada Lock and was so strong that Yada and CED were among the first cards in the game's history to be banned. It remained on the list for over 15 years where they were both deemed safe to release only somewhat recently. However, while Yada managed to escape the ban list unscathed, the original effect of Chaos Emperor Dragon would have still been just as busted in the modern day. So, to make it safe to release, it received an errata to nerf its effect. But this errata did more than just make CED safe. It made it unplayable. As while its effect was virtually the exact same in its original form, it now had a new restriction which prevented you from activating any other card or effects for the entire turn if you wanted to use CED's wipe. Which, while effective at preventing you from recreating the Yada Lock, also makes it virtually impossible for you to search CED, set up your graveyard for its summon, or do anything else if you want to use its effect, making it an incredibly awkward card to use. So awkward, in fact, that no one plays CED anymore, as its best use is as vanilla extender that is outclassed by most other chaos monsters in the game that actually allow you to use their effects, including CED's Pendulum Evolution, which despite having a weaker field wipe, actually has managed to see solid play in Dragon Link for its strength as an extender. 
But in terms of the original Emperor, so long as it has its modern restrictions, it'll likely never see play again. And it's honestly really sad to see because Emperor Dragon is an icon of early Yu-Gi-Oh! That showed just how busted cards could be. To the point where if CED still had its old effect, it would still be overpowered 20 years later. And while it's a rod allowed for you to come back from the ban list, it sucks that such a legendary card has been reduced to one of the worst chaos monsters in the game. And shining brightly at number 9 is Blue Eye Shiny Dragon, a monster designed by Pegasus that was meant to be capable of defeating the Egyptian gods. And if Shining Dragon is brought out to the field, it might actually succeed in that goal as it gains 300 attack for every dragon monster in your graveyard meaning that with enough dragons, its attack points can grow well beyond Oblis, Slifer, and Ra. But that's not all, as Shining Dragon also comes with an effect known as Shining Diffusion, which can negate any effect that targets it. Overall, these two effects make up a pretty solid boss monster, but in order to access them, you have to summon Shining Dragon in the first place, and the only way to do that is by tributing the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Even for Kaiba, this was a huge investment of resources, as it took him 5 turns in the Pyramid of Light movie to actually summon out Ultimate Dragon, and an extra few turns for him to draw into Shiny Dragon. But in Kaiba's case, he was more than willing to wait, as whether by his own judgement or the manipulations of Anubis, he truly believed that Shiny Dragon would lead him to victory. And Kaiba was absolutely right. You see, in his duel against Yugi, Kaiba held a fairly dominant position until Yugi brought out Sorcerer of Dark Magic whose effect happened to perfectly counter both Deck Destruction Virus and Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. But as soon as Kaiba summoned out Shiny Dragon, there was almost nothing Yuki could do, as its target protection meant that Sorcerer couldn't manipulate its stats, and its overwhelming attack forced Yugi on the defensive to the point where all he could do was appeal to Kaiba's senses, and try to warn him of the dark forces that were influencing the duel. Whether or not Kaiba believed this is hard to say, but he did end up attempting to destroy the Pyramid of Light with Shiny Dragon's other effect, so that he could have a perfect victory by summoning out the banished Egyptian gods with return from the different dimension, which might have been a solid OTK. But Anubis intervened to protect the pyramid and threw Kaiba to the side and took over the duel. But this wasn't the last we saw of Shiny Dragon as not only did Yugi revive it from the graveyard to destroy the Pyramid of Light, but it was the only card capable of taking down Anubis' monstrous form. However, in the actual game, Shiny Dragon isn't the god-busting tower as the anime made it out to be, and definitely isn't the ultimate Blue Eyes card as Kaiba believed. For what it's worth, its on-field effects were actually pretty solid for its time, and made it one heck of a beatstick that some decks might have genuinely struggled with. But the main issue with Shiny Dragon has never been its effects, it's because it takes a lot of effort to summon. Because in order to summon the Blue Eyes Shiny Dragon, you must first summon the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, and for the longest time, this was actually a pretty tall order. In fact, when Shiny Dragon first released, it was actually impossible, since Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon wouldn't be released for another year and a half. But even after Ultimate Dragon came to the TCG, Shiny Dragon was still unreliable, because you needed specifically three Blue Eyes and a way to fusion summon in order to go into Ultimate Dragon, as well as Shiny Dragon itself in order to bring it to the field, which is five specific cards of investment for a somewhat decent beat stick, when you could instead rely on individually powerful cards to either disrupt your opponent, or allow you to access even stronger monsters for a lower investment. Now, thankfully, with more modern cards, it's a lot easier to bring Shiny Dragon out to the field, but in the current format, it simply outclasses a boss monster, even when compared to other Blue Eyes cards. Who better embody what it means to be the ultimate Blue Eyes? And protecting the number 8 spot on this list is one of the simplest cards in Kaiba's arsenal, Negate Attack. In fact, it's so simple that the card's name pretty much explains what it does, as whenever your opponent declares an attack, you can use Negate Attack to target that attacking monster, literally negate the attack, and then end the battle phase. Now, it was pretty strange to see such a defensive card in Kaiba's beatdown focused deck, but the way that he used the card was actually pretty smart. He'd often use it to either protect his own monster and guarantee a follow-up, or cut the opponent off from a potential OTK. This was especially strong against Pegasus' Toon strategy, an entire deck revolving around monsters that could attack directly, which got especially dangerous whenever Pegasus had the likes of the Blue Eyes Toon Dragon on the field. And the reason why this play was so smart is because it actually has some solid bases in the TCG, where a ton of cards across the game's history have seen genuine competitive play for being able to fade a battle phase or prevent an attack. The big issue with Negate Attack, though, is that it's one of the worst battle faders you could possibly use. And that's because it's a counter trap that can only be activated specifically when your opponent's monster declares an attack, making it incredibly vulnerable to common removal options that your opponent will use to deal with it well before the battle phase even starts. On the other hand, the likes of Wabaku and Threatening Roar can be activated at any point in a turn, and can simply be chained to any removal effect while doing the same thing that Negate Attack would 
Meanwhile, classic hand traps like Battle Fader and Gores can also end the battle phase in their own way, while also providing you free advantage. Negate Attack just doesn't have the benefits to justify its use, as the only real upside it has over most other cards is that it's a counter trap, so it can be difficult to interact with once it's activated. But even then, there are a ton of better cards to use that just give you much better payoffs for the same condition. Wallow Disruption can mean that your opponent runs face first into destroying their own monster, Jelly Cannon can act as removal, and of course, the likes of Mirror Force can wipe an entire field. Now, in the modern era, cards that stop the battle phase and battle traps as a whole are currently a lot more niche, because in the modern game, it's a lot easier to set up a negate or just remove the trap from the field to make an OTK a lot safer. But even in decks that might value skipping your opponent's battle phase, or want to use battle traps in some way, there are an infinite number of better cards to use. So while Kaiba's strategy was actually pretty relevant, he picked one of the worst possible options to facilitate it. And embracing this season of giving at number 7 is Gift of the Mystical Elf, which you'd probably receive as a White Elephant exchange. Because all this particular gift does is allow you to gain 300 life points for every monster on the field. The way that Kaiba used the gift though was somewhat interesting. You see, in his Duelist Kingdom duel against Yugi, Kaiba knew that he'd be fighting an uphill battle, but in order to get the chance to face Pegasus and save his brother Mokuba, he had to assure victory in some way. And so his plan was to slowly assemble the pieces of the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, with the Gift of the Mystical Elf being used to provide him extra life points to stall out for a few more turns, as he believed that no matter how the duel turned out, as long as he got Ultimate Dragon on the field, he would win. Kaiba was technically right, as he did end up winning this duel, but Gift never had a big impact, as while it did allow him to recover life points, the 300 he gained didn't end up mattering, especially after Ultimate Dragon was defeated, which caused him to threaten to jump from the castle walls if Yugi didn't let him win. And if you play Gift of the Mystical Elf, you might be driven to the same point. Now it is important to prevent your opponent from reducing your life points to zero, and a lot of cards come with some kind of life point cost that can end up having a huge impact on a duel by making it easier for you to be OTK. But gaining life points is rarely ever going to be the reason that you win a duel, because it doesn't get you any closer to actually winning. And while higher life points can make it more difficult to OTK you, it's not worth giving up card advantage for. In fact, the best life point gain cards in Yu-Gi-Oh are the ones where increasing your life points is just a bonus as part of a better effect rather than the card's entire purpose, helping to facilitate a deck's regular game plan while also making it harder to reduce your life points to zero. But cards like Gift of the Mystical Elf don't really have a place in modern strategies where life points act more as a resource system than anything else, and most decks are more than willing to spend this resource if it gets them closer to the particular win condition. And Gift doesn't really facilitate any kind of win condition. But even if your deck desperately needed a way to gain life points to function, there are a ton of cards that exist that allow you to gain way more life points for a lot less investment. Overall, it's unlikely that the Gift of the Mystical Elf is ever going to be particularly impactful in a real duel, as even in the anime, it didn't really do much to turn the tide of the duel in Kaiba's favor. And duplicating to number 6 is Cloning, a trap card that let Kaiba use his opponent's monsters as a resource. And that's because Cloning actually summons a token whenever your opponent normal or flip summons a monster with a level, and that token will have the exact same type, level, attribute, attack, and defense, making it almost a one-to-one -one copy. But if the monster that your token was cloned from ends up being destroyed, your clone will also get popped too. Kaiba could have technically used cloning to use an opponent's strongest monster against them, but of course Kaiba was too prideful for that, and instead would simply use the clone token as a stepping stone to summon the Blue Eyes White Dragon. And once more, Kaiba showcased his intelligence as the way of using his token was genius, he just so happened to pick one of the worst token generators in the game. In general, cards that can summon free tokens have always been pretty strong, especially when you're able to convert those tokens into more powerful monsters by using them as material for an extra deck monster. But cloning itself is absolutely awful, and a huge part of that is because of its particular activation requirement. If cloning were just a trap card that can summon a token during any point in a turn, it would still be pretty bad as it doesn't interrupt your opponent in a meaningful way. But it would be okay as a slow extender or a way to block an attack, just like a trap monster. But you're instead entirely reliant on your opponent's normal summon to activate cloning at all. And while normal summoning is something a lot of decks do, you get a single opportunity to use it on your opponent's turn, or it's just a dead card. And the worst part is that, it's not likely that your opponent's normal summon is even going to have decent enough stats to copy, as more often than not, they're just going to convert that monster into a much stronger one using their extra deck, and you wouldn't be able to copy that monster since it's a special summon, meaning that it's pretty likely your clone token is going to be being over or removed from the field before you get a chance to use it. So as a whole, cloning is slow, awkward, and it's unlikely you'll ever get to use the benefits of the card in the first place. 
which honestly makes it a miracle that Kaiba was able to use the card in the first place, even if he had a decent strategy in mind for it. Hiding his shame behind a mask number 5 is Masked Beastess Guardius, a card that Kaiba actually won from Loomis and Umbra to Americ's Rare Hunters. And that makes a lot of sense, as both of Guardius' effects resolve around the use of masks. In order to bring out to the field, you have to tribute two monsters, including either Grand Teague Elder or Melchid the Four-Faced Beast. This gives you access to its massive 3300 attack, but also means that whenever Guardius is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can target a monster opponent controls and equip it with the Mask of Remnants directly from your deck, which allows you to take control of that monster permanently. Now, taking control of an opponent's monster sounds quite strong, but in practice, Descardius is really awkward to use. So awkward, in fact, that Kaiba never actually used it in a duel and only ever revealed it as part of his four-way duel against Yugi, Joey, and Merrick. And this was actually a pretty tactical move from Kaiba, as the turn order of this four-way duel was going to be determined by the attack strength of the monster revealed. Whoever had the highest attack was going to go first, but each player had to banish their revealed monster. So instead of banishing a copy of Blue Eyes to guarantee you went first, Kaiba instead chose to reveal Guardius, a monster that he'd won earlier that he couldn't summon anyway. However, we do get to see Des Guardius see some real play in Yugi and Kaiba's tag duel against Loomis and Umbra, where it put on an impressive display, beating over Blue Eyes White Dragon and stealing Valkyrie on the Magnet Warrior with a Mask of Remnants. But the funny thing about this duel was that Loomis didn't even summon it properly, and instead had to rely on the effect of Chosen One, because even in the anime, summoning Des Guardius can be really unwieldy. Tributing two monsters to bring it out is a pretty big investment already. But what really hurts Descardius is that at least one of the monsters you tribute has to be one of two very specific and pretty bad normal monsters. But the worst part of this entire package is Mask of Remnants, which is entirely reliant on Descardius to be useful. Because if you happen to draw into Remnants, its only effect is to reshovel itself back into the deck, making it one of the most useless cards in the game. And if you want to get any mileage out of this package at all, you must play Remnants, as otherwise you're just jumping through a ton of hoops for a 3300 vanilla beat stick, which isn't really impressive in the modern era. But even if you do choose to play Remnants, it's honestly not worth the effort of summoning Discardius and playing either Melchid or Tiki Elder, when you could instead play the easier to use mind control cards that don't require any setup at all. Overall, Masked Beast Discardius just isn't worth the effort and deck space required to play it, because even if you play every card required to make it useful, there's no guarantee you'll even draw into it. So Kaiba definitely had the right idea by getting it out of his deck as soon as possible. Taking control number four is Mesmeric Control, a card that allowed for Kaiba to influence his opponent's monsters. But not in the same way as a card like Brain Control or Change of Heart would, because in the anime, Mesmer Control simply made an opponent's monster sleepy, which reduced its attack by 800. This is a lot different to the TCG version of the card, though, which instead prevents your opponent from changing the battle position of their monsters, except via card effects, during their next turn. Regardless of this drastic difference, Kaiba took Mesmer Control to one of the most important duels of his life against Maximilian Pegasus the creator of dual monsters who had kidnapped Kaiba's brother, Mokuba, and locked his soul inside of a card. So in order to save his brother, Kaiba did everything he could to counter Pegasus' strategy, which is why Mesmeric Control came in clutch. Because when Pegasus tried to destroy Rude Kaiser, Kaiba used Mesmeric Control to reduce Parrot Dragon's attack by 800, allowing Kaiser to make a counterattack, destroying Parrot Dragon and leaving Pegasus shocked from the surprise. But this all turned out to be a ruse, as Pegasus was just simply toying with Kaiba. With his Millennium Eye, he knew that his set card was Mesmeric Control and chose to play into it to make himself out to be a total amateur so he could further aggravate and humiliate Kaiba before taking full control of the duel. Ultimately, Kaiba lost this duel due to factors well outside of his control, as there was no way he'd be able to predict the power of the Millennium Eye. But if you ever need to save a family member soul like he did, it's not a smart idea to play Mesmeric Control. Stopping your opponent from changing battle positions technically restricts them, but it's one of the least impactful restrictions in the game, and doesn't stop your opponent from playing, unlike other floodgates which can stop spell cards, negate all effects, or even lock an opponent out of their main extra deck monster. Now, there are technically a few extremely specific situations where Mesmeric Control could be useful, but even in the best case scenario, you would much rather the card in your hand be any kind of removal or just a better floodgate, because more often than not, Mesmeric Control is just going to do nothing. Reinforce number three spot is Boar Soldier, one of the worst monsters in the game. And at first glance, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Boar Soldier has any kind of utility, as its 2000 attack stat makes it seem like it could be a decently strong beat stick. But you need to bring it to the field first, and if you try to normal summon Boar Soldier, it immediately destroys itself. And what's worse is that even if you summon it to the field in another way, the moment your opponent controls a monster, Boar Soldier reduces its own attack by a thousand. Kaiba was no stranger to these kinds of difficult to summon cards, such as the likes of Rare Metal Dragon, which was difficult to bring out, but gave him a strong beat stick as a solid payoff. 
but even he struggled to make Boar Soldier work, as he only ever used it in a single duel. And it wasn't even against a real opponent, as he was trying to test the power of Albus the Tormentor against one of his dueling robots, who was using his own deck against him. And if Kaiba had actually drawn into Boar Soldier, it would have been a dead card. But thankfully, his dueling robot had set Cyberjar, which allowed both Kaiba and the robot to special summon a bunch of level 4 lower monsters from the top of their deck. And one of the monsters Kaiba summoned happened to be a Boar Soldier. Given Kaiba's usual genius, you might think that each monster summoned had a role to play in his strategy, and that Boar Soldier held some secret strength that would put him at a huge advantage. But in actuality, Boar Soldier did absolutely nothing during this entire duel, except temporarily defend Kaiba's life points until it was tributed off for Obelisk. Boar Soldier has almost no impact in this duel. In fact, Kaiba was lucky that it was even able to be used as a tribute fodder. Boar Soldier is a card that almost doesn't want to be played, because if you want to bring it to the field, you either have to set it, special summon it, or find a way to prevent its effect from resolving. All of these things are possible, and if Boar Soldier had any kind of interesting payoff, it might have been worth jumping to those extra hoops. But instead of rewarding with a strong effect, Boar Soldier is pretty much just a vanilla beat stick. In fact, Boar Soldier is actively worse than most other vanilla monsters. Not only because it's more difficult to summon, but because the moment your opponent controls any monster, Boar Soldier gets scared and loses attack, ruining any strength that could have as a beat stick. The only deck where you might even consider running Boar Soldier at all is in a skill drain beatdown deck, as with skill drain up, you don't have to deal with either of Boar Soldier's downsides, making it a solid 2000 attack beat stick. But even in classic Yu-Gi-Oh, there are quite a few low level beat sticks that not only have higher attack, but have downsides that are a lot more manageable if you don't happen to have skill drain up. As a whole, it's a miracle that Boar Soldier found its way into Kaiba's test deck, as it's nearly unusable in both the anime and the actual TCG. And Kaiba likely realized how bad the card was himself, as after this single test duel, he never used Boar Soldier again. Lighting up the darkness in number 2 is the Pyramid of Light, the titular card of the Pyramid of Light movie and Anubis's calling card. In the actual TCG, all the Pyramid of Light does is let you special summon both Andro Sphinx and Sphinx Talia from your hand with their own effects. And if it happens to be removed from the field in any capacity, you have to destroy both Andro and Talia Sphinx on your side of the field. But the anime version actually had an extra effect, which banished every god card on the field. And it's for this reason that the Pyramid of Light was able to counter the Egyptian gods. You see, after Battle City, Kaiba grew frustrated that he'd been defeated by Yugi once more. And now that his rival had the three Egyptian god cards, it seemed like beating him would be an impossibility. This led to him eventually winning both Blue Eyes Shiny Dragon and the Pyramid of Light from Pegasus in the hopes they'd give him a way of actually defeating the gods. But unbeknownst to Kaiba, he was being influenced by a mummified sorcerer known as Anubis, whose spirit had returned to seek revenge on the Pharaoh Atem and chose Kaiba as his champion to take his vengeance. This caused Kaiba to challenge Yugi to another duel, one in which he did the unthinkable by giving Yugi an opportunity to summon all three of his Egyptian gods at the same time, just so he could banish them from the field with the Pyramid of Light. However, by activating the pyramid, he had trapped both himself and Atem into a shadow game, where every life point lost would do real physical harm to each duelist. Kaiba eventually broke free from Anubis' control and attempted to pop his own Pyramid of Light, but Anubis intervened, and used his magic to protect the pyramid and throw Kaiba aside to take over the duel, summoning both Andro and Talia from thin air and putting Atem into a tight spot as his deck was running thin. Thankfully, from the Millennium Puzzle, Yugi and his friends managed to expose Anubis' weak point disrupting his magic in a line for attempt to pop the pyramid, which destroyed both of Anubis' Sphinxes. But this just gave Anubis an opportunity to summon out Thenin, the Great Sphinx, another boss monster that almost managed to single-handedly defeat Atem. Now, all of this sounds really impressive, as the anime did its best to make the Pyramid of Light come across as a real threat on par with the Egyptian gods, especially because even if you managed to destroy the pyramid, it would just summon out a new, stronger boss monster. But the Pyramid of Light and its Sphinxes are far, far weaker than the Egyptian gods when talking about the TCG. Pyramid of Light does literally nothing when it's activated. It doesn't interrupt or restrict an opponent, it doesn't give you any kind of advantage, and it doesn't change game states at all. The only benefit that it gives you for being on the field is that it allows you to summon both Andro and Talia from your hand by paying 500 life points. But because Pyramid of Light is a trap card, you have to wait through your opponent's entire turn before you get any benefit from it at all and hope that your opponent doesn't remove it from the field. And even if everything goes right, the Sphinxes that Pyramid enables are just high attack beat sticks that come with summoning sickness, which is a pretty bad payoff for the amount of time and resources you have to sink into summoning them if you use the Pyramid of Light. But the thing is, none of the Sphinxes actually need Pyramid of Light on the field to be summoned. Both Andro and Talia can be summoned via regular means, and then it just needs both of its parts to be destroyed at the same time. So even decks that want to summon the Sphinxes won't play Pyramid of Light, because it's simply just a lot easier to summon them out normally. All of this is without even considering Pyramid's downside. 
where if it's removed from the field, you have to destroy any Andro and Talias you control. You might think that this technically isn't a downside, as you want to pop both of your Sphinxes at the same time to summon Thendon. But in reality, it just puts a glowing weak spot in the strategy that tells your opponent to pop the Pyramid before you get both of your Sphinxes on the field. Overall, if Pyramid of Light was a card that did nothing, it would be slightly better than its TCG version, as it can even be detrimental in the deck it was made for. But even if you manage to perfectly set up Pyramid and your Sphinxes, the boss monster you summon from it are mediocre at best, and not worth the effort, especially in the modern era where it's a lot easier to summon high attack monsters. Firing off at number 1 is Virus Cannon, a card so bad that it almost caused Kaiba to lose against Ishizu Ishtar in the Battle City Finals. Virus Cannon can destroy an opponent's deck, but how it does that depends on which version you're looking at. The TCG Virus Cannon requires you to tribute any number of monsters you control, and then force your opponent to send the same number of spells from their deck to the graveyard. The anime version of this card is a lot stronger, as with this single card, you get to destroy every spell card in your opponent's hand and deck for no cost. And that's why Kaiba valued the card so much, as it gave him a way to prevent your opponent from using any spell cards against him. This was a genius move in theory, as he paired it with Crush Card Virus, one of the most busted trap cards that also destroyed an opponent's stack by getting rid of strong monsters, so that the only cards to be left with were their weakest monsters and a bunch of trap cards. However, the one time that Kaiba managed to use both Virus Cannon and Crush Card Virus in the anime, his opponent was Ishizu Ishtar. This meant that his strategy backfired almost immediately, because after having her deck destroyed, Ishizu simply activated Exchange of the Spirit to return every card she milled back to her deck and leave Kaiba with only 6 cards left. Arguably, the only reason Kaiba's strategy failed was because he happened to face an opponent who could benefit from it. But interestingly enough, if you played Virus Cannon in the TCG, you'd notice that a ton of strategies actually benefit from having their spells milled. From Fluffles getting free searches from Toy Vendor, to Infernoble getting to set up with Phoenix Blade, a ton of strategies can get a lot from milling their own spell cards. To the point where some strategies are willing to play Foolish Burial Goods. And funnily enough, one of the best strategies that can take advantage of milling spells happens to be Ishizu Telemits which plays quite a few spell cards that they're eager to mill. So if you happen to make the same mistake as Kaiba and use Virus Cannon to force them to destroy their own deck, a lot of strategies would be happy to get these mills for free, especially because they're the ones that get to choose which spell cards they send, which means that you don't even get a chance to scout out their strategy or snipe an important spell. This is already a terrible effect on its own, but Virus Cannon also comes with an associated cost required that you have to tribute monsters use it in the first place, helping your opponent in two ways by letting them mill their select spells while also getting rid of your monsters for them. Even if you're playing a dedicated mill strategy, there is no way to justify the amount of resources you have to invest for Virus Cannon to have any kind of impact. But even then, it's likely your opponent is going to benefit from it anyways. But maybe the biggest kick in the face for the card is that if you want to mimic the best part of its anime effect and rip out your opponent's spell cards from their hand before they can use them, you can, and for a much lower cost, run Eradicator Epidemic Virus, which can also hit trap cards too. Like Pyramid of Light, Virus Cannon is worse than useless, but instead of just being a detriment to you, it's also an active benefit for an opponent, and is only a card that you'd want to play if you're trying to lose. And it speaks volumes that despite being wielded by the second greatest duelist in the world, Virus Cannon was almost the reason that Kaiba was demoted to simply being a top 8 instead. Alright, and that's the list. If you think we missed any other worse cards, or have any ideas for other characters like for us to cover next, please let us know down in the comments below. Remember to like the video, subscribe if you want to keep up to date on future videos, and thanks for watching.